Okay, folks, if you'll give me your attention, we'll get started. Uh, lovely to have you all here. Welcome. Uh, I, I think I recognize every face in the place, but in case I don't, uh, the, uh, I, I want to welcome you to Cantini. This is the historic estate of the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick, who lived in a home about 500 yards that way. Uh, he uh, was the longtime editor, publisher of the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, passed away in 1955 and left this estate uh, as a park for the people of Illinois. He named it Cantini in honor of a tiny little village in France, 75 miles north of Paris, where he fought as a citizen soldier with the 1st Division in America's first battle in Europe and the first battle in the history of the 1st Division. Uh, he was profoundly affected by his service in the war. He was a great friend of soldiers and veterans for the rest of his life. Uh, he wanted, as I said, uh, the park uh, left for the people. Uh, he endowed our parent organization, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, with his very considerable wealth. Uh, and he said, don't forget my beloved 1st Division. And so there's a 1st Division Museum at Cantini Park, which, of which I'm the director. Uh, and that's fortuitous for us because the 1st Division has never been off active duty since June 26, 1917. Every single day, the men and now women of the 1st Infantry Division have been serving our country. And so we have this uh, series of lectures and books and other things that we do uh, to describe that uh, very compelling service. And uh, tonight, we're going to talk about one more recent aspect, uh, for relatively recent uh, aspect of First Division history, uh, Operation Desert Storm. Before we do that, uh, I want to remind you all that the book that our author is going to talk about tonight is for sale in the gift shop. To get to the gift shop, <laughs> you go out those doors and keep going around the round-shaped building and in the front door, and a lovely young woman named Amanda in there will be glad to sell you a book, which you're going to want to have because our author is going to stay after the talk tonight and sign copies of the book. So please rush down there and buy the book. And also, I usually announce this at the end, and I will, but we also have uh, veterans here from Cantini Post 556 of the American Legion who will gladly accept donations in the red, white, and blue uh, mailbox, which will go to the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Vets in Wheaton. And if you're not familiar with that organization, you should be. Uh, we, we estimate homeless populations are very hard to count. But we estimate that in the state of Illinois, 1,100 honorably discharged veterans will sleep on the streets tonight. Most of them are in the Chicago area, and the Midwest Shelter does a fantastic job of reaching out to those guys and gals and getting them back on their feet and leading them to self-sufficiency so they can be members, full-fledged members of the society that they serve to defend. So I hope that you'll feel uh, uh, inspired uh, to share your spare change with the, um, with the Legion. Okay, so tonight's uh, talk obviously is about Desert Storm. Uh, the author that I'll introduce, Greg Fontenot, is an uh, I could say an old friend. He's a friend of many years, okay? Uh, Greg uh, served for 28 years in the United States Army. He rose to the rank of colonel. Uh, he had a distinguished career. At one point, he and I both taught history together at West Point, and we've been in touch with each other ever since. Uh, he commanded a battalion, which he'll talk about tonight, a tank battalion in Operation Desert Storm. He commanded a brigade in... Uh, uh, in the Balkans during the peacekeeping operations to which American troops were deployed in the 1990s. He was the director of the School of Advanced Military Studies. Uh, that's a second year program of the Command and General Staff College uh, at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where those officers who have already been selected for the one year program then compete for uh, uh, one of the very few positions for a second year uh, at the School of Advanced Military Studies and are then selected for special staff positions upon graduation throughout the major warfighting headquarters of the United States Army. And uh, Greg directed that program for several years. 
Uh, he is a great historian. He has written, among many, many other articles and things, uh, a book. Uh, he was the lead author on the Army's official study uh, a few years into Operation Iraqi Freedom called On Point, the United States Army and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, several years ago, uh, I guess I can call it several years ago, uh, looking ahead to the 25th anniversary of Desert Storm in 2016, uh, Greg and I were talking about the need for uh, a serious study of one of our combat divisions, and particularly the first divisions, and he agreed that that's something that ought to be done, and I said, well, why don't you write it? And uh, to make a long story short, we talked to each other into doing that, and he's done a fabulous job, uh, and it came out uh, uh, early uh, this year, and I, I think it's fantastic. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, a close friend who I've known for many years, a distinguished soldier, a great historian, and somebody who I'm sure will give you a new view of Operation Desert Storm, Greg Fontenot. I am uh, delighted to be here. I, I tried to run for mayor. Uh, I didn't get to meet quite everyone, but I met quite a few. And uh, I want to recognize a couple of people. Uh, uh, John Hannon, a recently retired Colonel United States Army, uh, was one of my tank platoon leaders. And, and even though he's heard me before, he elected to uh, come yet again. I don't know what that says about him, but John, would you put your hand up? Uh, John was a hell of a good tank platoon leader. Then he was a very good scout platoon leader. Then he went off to be an MI officer. And then he decided he wanted to go where the real money was. And he became an acquisition corps officer. That is, he's the guy that wrote contracts to make things happen around. But he had the good sense to always retain his uh, MI colors on his blue uniform. So it's good to have you here. Uh, Terry Heuser is here from uh, combat engineer from the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam. I want to make sure I recognize him. Uh, when I think about the engineers in Vietnam, the first thing that comes to my mind is a guy named Jerry Sin. Jerry was an engineer, battalion commander, the first engineers when I was the division plans officer for a two-star named Ron Watts. And I once asked Jerry, I said, Jerry, you know, how did, you know, what did you do in Vietnam? You know, tell me about the big war. I missed it by about six months. And he said, well, when he got to Vietnam, they said, well, Lieutenant Sam, what'd you like to do? He's going to engineer battalion. And he said, we got a job in the AVLB company and we have a job in Flumpty Flump Platoon of Alpha Company and we have an engineer reconnaissance job. And Jerry thought, Engineer reconnaissance, that sounds really exciting, like measuring the spans on bridges, determining the bridge classification, how many tanks could cross it at once, that kind of thing. Well, so he said, I'd like to be an engineer scout. Well, that's what the tunnel rats were called. <laughs> so Jerry's uh, reconnaissance consisted of crawling into tunnels that might be full of bad guys and or snakes, mostly snakes, with a 45 and a flashlight. Despite having made that bad decision, Jerry retired as lieutenant general. He's now uh, the secretary treasurer of the uh, Association of the United States Army, another great combat veteran of the First Division. I met some, uh, some sailors today, and I met uh, a, a PJ, a pair, uh, pair jumper. I don't know if you guys know what PJs do, and they're the guys in Vietnam that you see in the Vietnam movies, like if you ever watch Bat 21, they lower this, this guy, this insane guy through the jungle canopy. And he uh, grabs old Bat 2-1 and, and they haul him up. So we got a PJ. And, and to prove it, I've seen his, uh, his Purple Heart with four oak leaf clusters. That means he got shot at and hit five times. Uh, now, I told him in the Army, we call that kind of a guy a magnet ass. You know, but, but he said it wasn't bullets, so that didn't count. Uh, anyway, for those of you who haven't met, I hope I get a chance to meet you later. And I see you're here, John, and I have the answer. I'm going to wait, though, for the question. I'm not going to prompt you. When the time is right, you'll ask the question. So why talk about Desert Storm? Quite apart from the fact that I'm a starving artist and you really need to buy 10 or 12 books uh, each. They make great gifts for your friends and they're great conversation stoppers. When you drop a 520 page book about a four day war on a table, it'll bring conversation to a halt. <laughs> I hasten to add that 100 pages of that are in notes so you don't have to read those. But there are a number of reasons why you might want to read about Operation Desert Storm. First of all, almost nothing has been written about it. At the very end of the war, a bunch of guys went out and wrote books, instant books, that made them money overnight. Schwarzkopf, for one. And uh, if you want to understand a different point of view of Schwarzkopf, do buy my book and read it, because you'll discover not everybody thinks Norm Schwarzkopf was a, was a great hero. 
The uh, second thing that, uh, that, that was written was political assessments. Uh, uh, Bernstein's book, The Commanders. Gordon and Trainer's book, The General's War. All of these things were designed to catch your attention, get you to read it really quick, and then move on. The other thing that, that you don't read about is an assessment of the post-conflict result. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but I'd like you to take a little time to think about what's happened since Desert Storm. What, is, what does that mean? Why did we go to the war there in the first place? If you want to know why we went to war there in the first place, it's easy. The Carter Doctrine, articulated in uh, the last uh, State of the Union speech that President Carter gave. And it's a reasonably sound doctrine. And yes, it was in part about oil, but it was also about the, the order in which the, the world exists. The post-war hubris in America about the end of the Cold War and the end of this problem, this apparently decisive solution to Saddam Hussein, is part of the reason nothing's been written about it. And as a consequence of nothing been written about it, we haven't thought about it. Because we haven't thought about it, guess where we went again in 2003? For no very good reason. And we're still there. Uh, we went to Afghanistan in 2000, now I'm repeating history here, and we stayed there for I don't know what reason. I haven't written about that. In fact, I've decided from now on, I've told Paul this, I'm only writing about dead people for the rest of my life. If they aren't dead, I don't want to know anything about them. Uh, the people that you write about that are alive want to argue with you about your interpretation, and my answer to them always is write your own book. So I have written my own book because Paul and I talked about it. And so what does is, what is this talk about? This, this war was truly a forgotten war. As we go in, Korea was a forgotten war, but it's not been forgotten anymore. It's well understood now. But ODS, Operation Desert Storm, we really haven't thought about it. And because we haven't thought about it, we've made some other mistakes. So I want you to help us think about it. I want to start with an analogy. An army is like a sandcastle, is my analogy. Have you ever built a sandcastle? If, you, if you've ever built a sandcastle, raise your hand. What happens if water comes to the sandcastle? The sandcastle erodes, change. The army that won the war in Desert Storm, the Cold War Army, was an excellent first-class institution. It no longer exists. The army that went to Vietnam was very good, well-led, fought sound tactical fights, and a policy wasn't so sound, and that war ended in failure. And that army did not exist in 1970. The army that existed in 1970 was broken. It was riven with morale issues. It was underfunded. As one of my uh, interviewees said, nobody understands how bad the Army was in 1972. But we rebuilt the sandcastle with cooler turrets, better articulated moats, and the rest of it. That Army's gone. The Army that we're fighting with in OAF and OEF, as uh, Mr. Rumsfeld said, is not necessarily the Army he would have chosen. That sandcastle is gone, too. These things don't last because the Army turns over at a rapid rate. Soldiers enlist and move on. The, the Marine Corps even mandates it. If you, don't make, uh, if you don't get beyond Staff Sergeant at year 12 or 13, you're out. We don't have quite the same rigorous upper out policy as the Marine Corps does, but our enlisted soldiers, our officers, our, our uh, NCOs turn over, and they turn over pretty rapidly. So they, the institution, the structure of the institution may remain, the notion of the sandcastle, but the castle itself is constantly having to be rebuilt. I want you to remember that in the background. And I am going to show you a couple of pictures because I think pictures do help uh, tell, tell a thousand words. Am I in control of this thing? Or, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's, uh, let's get started. The Army from 70 to 90. After the Vietnam War, a war which we lost, the end states we imagined were not achieved. Therefore, by any definition, that's an L. But the Army could have done two things. It actually, could have done any number of things. One alternative would have been to take the German Army's approach at the end of the war in 1918 and talk about the civilians let us down. Dereliction of duty by H.R. McMaster makes just that argument, that uh, the President, the Joint Chiefs, and others let us down. Reasonable argument. But it doesn't solve the problem for the Army, which was that by the end of the Vietnam War, it was angst-laden, it was riven with uh, corruption, it had serious problems. They changed themselves. And you know who one of the guys that led the change? And I know I only had 45 minutes, and I'd like to talk all 45 about this guy because my impression of him changed when I did the research in this book, and that's General William C. Westmoreland. 
He may not have been the great field commander in MACV in Vietnam, but as the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, he did some things that were really remarkable. Number one, he understood way before President Nixon made it a campaign platform in the Republican campaign uh, of that year, in November of, that, of 1969, uh, uh, 1970 rather, uh, Mr. Uh, Nixon made it a platform uh, item that we would integrate the Army and increase the number of women in the Army as a consequence. When he came home in summer of 1969, Westmoreland already had reckoned that he had to be done. In fact, the most stringent opposition to integration of women in the Army came from the Women's Army Corps. Why is that, do you suppose? Think about it for a second. Why would the Women's Army Corps object to integrating women in the Army? Amy. They would no longer control the fate of women in the Army. And the last Brigadier General, female Brigadier General that commanded was the one that understood that in order to, to advance the cause of women in the Army, she would have to give up the Women's Army Corps. But they first started by fighting it. Institutions don't like to change. The first thing they like to do is, hey, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Nothing to see here, move along. There should be no surprise to us that people have cover-ups and things happen in government that we don't like because institutions are conservative and defensive, including the Women's Army Corps. I was incredibly surprised that the guy in charge of advancing the cause on that was none other than William C. Westmoreland. He knew he had a problem with his officer corps, so he commissioned a study on officer leadership. That study led to the, uh, a revitalization of the education of, uh, of officers in the Army. They wanted to improve the condition of non-commissioned officer leadership. We had no formal education system for non-commissioned officers. My dad was a non-commissioned officer both in the Navy and the Army. He had an eighth grade education. He was self-educated with a GED, and he went to school at night to learn other things. But the Army said, you know, we're going we're gonna to get people who are like my dad. We better find a way to educate them. So we developed the non-commissioned non officer education system, which was also a very important part of that. They looked at things like, if you're going to go to a volunteer army, do we really want the volunteers spending time doing things that don't contribute to military readiness? I washed pots at 3.30 in the morning on KP. There was nothing about kitchen police that contributed to my education as an army officer, except to understand that I didn't want to wake, be the last guy to be awakened so I wouldn't have pots. So one morning, I was really lucky, and I got dishes. And we had a dishwasher. But of course, that morning, it broke. What I learned from doing KP, you know, it could be written on the back of your hand. Don't do KP. So we got rid of that. We got rid of grass cutting details, pipe claying, cross belts in the 18th century. Unit. Wait a minute, we're still doing that at West Point, aren't we? I forgot that. We, we, we even quit shining shoes because none of that contributed to military readiness. So the Army changed its culture and said, hey, what do I have to do to get ready? And if it doesn't contribute to that, I'm not going to do it. There are some other things they did here. They were real revitalized, and uh, the notion about married soldiers, once you have volunteer soldiers, the truth changes. When I came in the Army, soldiers were drafted. By 73, when Volar, Volunteer Army, came in, soldiers could be married. They didn't have to, you had to ask permission, and you couldn't be married before you were Sergeant E5 because you didn't have enough money. But once you could be married as soon as you came in the Army, they did that. One morning, First Sergeant Vernon P. Neville, First Sergeant of Charlie Company, 163 Armor, 1st Infantry Division, uh, found a van with the engine running, and there was nobody at the driver's wheel. So he peeked in, and there was a woman and a tiny baby living in there. And this is winter in Fort Riley, which is, you know, it's not as bitter as Chicago, but it's a close second. And we found that, uh, you know, Private Hoiser, if I may use your name, Terry, was sleeping in the barracks where it was warm, but his mom and his wife and his kid were sleeping in a car where it was cold. Vernon Neville took the kid and the mom home. We didn't have a pay scale that would allow them to afford to be married. We had uh, NCOs, wives, and kids on women and infants program, the WIC program. We had them on food stamps. You had, you had families working multiple jobs in order for a guy to be in the Army. That made no sense if you're going to have volunteers. We also rev revitalized concepts in development and doctrine. The M4 Sherman tank that's out here it was built in accordance with a concept. The concept was tanks wouldn't fight other tanks. They would follow the penetrations of the enemy with a low velocity, high silhouetted, rapidly moving tank, which meant that it got blown up, burned to the ground by all the German tanks uh, on the other side because the concept was flawed. You could not expect the tank 
not to have to fight other tanks. For those of you that understand anything about World War II, we built anti-tank guns to fight other tanks. Turned out that concept was flawed. We changed our concepts. Imagine that, the Army having changed. That was led by World War II veterans who learned the hard way as junior officers. Among them, people like General Depew, General Westmoreland himself, uh, General Gorman. Gorman actually started as a sailor, uh, but by this time, uh, he was helping to revitalize training. He learned that on the ground in Vietnam. When you look at uh, some of these other things, training went from number of hours to content. How many, does it matter how many hours you study gunnery if the content of the gunnery study has no utility? So we went, we went to task, conditions, and standards. What is the task? Under what conditions should I perform it? And to what standards must it be performed for it to work? Those kind of things rapidly changed the Army, and we changed the doctrine to accommodate it. I'm not going to talk more about that. I'd ask you to take the time to read the book, but I want to get you the sense of why did things happen the way they did? Not so much an account of what happened, but why did they happen the way they did? The Army reinvented itself. It thought about how to operate in a totally different way. And we inculcated, last but not least, a culture of readiness. So I want to give you a little context and time using uh, my own battalion. We were manned at level number two, or ALO two as it was called, which meant that I could man nine of my 12 tank platoons. We didn't have enough soldiers. We didn't have enough money. I had six tanks in my first tank platoon, supposed to have five, but the S3 kindly lent me his tank. And I had seven people counting me. Each tank supposed to have a crew of four. The Army in 1970 was in deep trouble. It was underfunded, undermanned, and undercared about. I had a tank in my platoon that didn't have a rangefinder when I got there. 18 months later, I still didn't have a rangefinder because it was going to cost, you know, $2.50 or whatever rangefinders cost. That context, uh, that background, changed by uh, 1989. In 1989, we trained the National Training Center. And I want to make a couple comments about the National Training Center. It's at Fort Irwin, California. It's the size of Rhode Island, and there's nothing out there. You can do about anything you want to except scare the desert tortoises or uh, drive over uh, ancient Indian ruins or mess with the oases. But when you go out there, you have to understand that the way the Army set that up, they made it so the blue forces couldn't win. So every time the blue force went out there, if you did well, the next time they changed the conditions, the next battle, to make it more difficult. So when you go to the Congress and say, this NTC is really doing good stuff for us, they want to know how many times did blue win. And blue won four times out of 14, say. So, well, that's not very good. Well, that's because you don't understand that it. it's all about task conditions and standards. It's not about outcomes. The Army came almost like a communist organization where, you know, Comrade Hannon would get up and admit his failures to the rest of the Soviet. And we would encourage Comrade Hannon to learn better. The after-action review process, we called it, made an incredible difference. My battalion, John's battalion, trained in the August, September 1989 at the National Training Center. Uh, we also supported training of other units. When we weren't training for ourselves, we were providing the opposing forces for units that were getting ready to go. So that meant we had to learn the other guy's doctrine, the other guy's equipment, and how he operated. Those kinds of things made us uh, think about operations and combat far differently than before. A uh, quick timeline uh, on the fighting. So Saddam invades 4 August. Everybody, for me, uh, that's one of the things I remember. Like, I'm old enough to remember where it was when John Kennedy was killed. This was another one of those times. Uh, you can see, I'll let you look at that. Uh, I'm telling you about some of this because getting there is not half the fun. But your army came home from Germany, came home from Korea. There's a handful of us left. We're no longer deployed forward. So if you ask us to do something as taxpayers, you have to figure out how we're going to get from the fort to the port and from the port to the other port. And there's a couple of physics rules you want to remember. In 2050, water will still weigh 8.01 pounds uh, per gallon at sea level. Physics will still matter in 2050. Uh, maybe not as much as now, but probably going to still matter. So getting there is not easy. And I'll talk about how, how do we get there. Inglorious things, loading tanks on trains. And we had a World War II uh, railhead. It had one dock. That dock that you see there was built with a portion of 
an armored vehicular launched bridge, or AVLB, as the ramp to get us on, and that was a spur that was built. We got alerted on the 8th of November, on the 4th and 5th of December we were doing that, having built the ramps and the railhead. To get there, you have to have the infrastructure to depart from. And that means that your installations in the U.S. Army have to be adequate. And we got there on any number of ways. That's the Jolly Rubino, and the, the guy who's dourly looking at her over his shoulder is Burt Maggart, commander of the 1st Brigade. Jolly Rubino is a rusty, tired Italian row row ship, which sank a few years later. But fortunately, it did not sink on the way to Saudi Arabia. And I'll let you read the statistical analysis of, you know, the kind of things that happened to get us there. I want to talk a little bit about operational phases of Desert Storm. You know, you don't just, hey, let's go have a war, everybody show up at once. That's not quite how it works. Uh, maybe, I don't know how this works. Oh, here we go. So we have uh, got to get to the, from the port down to Beaumont. You saw 600 trains or 1,900 cars, 600, 6,000 pieces of gear, whatever it was. We're going to move to and defend the border first. Because when we got there, the border was being defended by the 18th Corps, which is the 24th Infantry Division, and the 82nd Airborne, uh, two Egyptian divisions, a Syrian Army Division, and a bunch of uh, smaller units from the Saudi Army and from the other Persian Gulf Country Armies. This was a coalition of uh, a bunch of different countries, many of whom had nothing in common. Uh, the DISCOM commander, our Division Support Command commander, was taken prisoner by one of our allied divisions, and uh, we had to negotiate for his release. The Syrians took him and almost didn't let him back. Uh, uh, I ran for my life with a couple of my guys because the Kuwaitis wanted to take us prisoner one day. It was a, it was a peculiar coalition. This was not, you know, a lot of slapping and dapping and, uh, you know, kisses on both cheeks. So getting over there was uh, difficult. Penetrating the Iraqi defense was phase three. Uh, exploit the penetration, and I'll let you look at the rest of it. So when you do this, you know, I want to show you something that sets the context. You've, also, you've, you've seen the, the, the left hook, I'm thinking, but here's what it looks like on a, on a chart. Um, if you look at that, and I'm going to come around and look at it the same way you are. If, if you look at the, the hook as it goes around the left, the guys on the far end go further than the guys on the near side. We're on the inside of the curve, but we also are the only ones that had to fight through somebody to even start the line. Everybody else had no one to fight. You see where the uh, bad guy units peter out? Out there to the left? The 48th Infantry Division, those guys, there were almost none of them out there. That, that, uh, there was almost no resistance out there. The last place that they had fortified positions was where we went through in the 1st Infantry Division. So when you think about context, this is big stuff. 350,000 American troops, 7th U.S. Corps had uh, six divisions of its own. The uh, 18th Airborne Corps had uh, three U.S. divisions and a French division. Uh, the Marine Corps was there with a division of its own and a U.S. Army tank brigade. The S Egyptians had a corps of two divisions and a Syrian Army division, which wouldn't cross the border. So once they went north, the Syrians were, quote, in reserve. And then there was a, a Saudi-led uh, Arab Corps on the east. So this was an army group-sized operation, the like of which not had been seen uh, since World War II, bigger than the Korean War in terms of uh, total numbers of troops uh, in, in one operation. So this is a big operation. That's the point. So parallel planning, uh, that's a word we use a lot in the Army, and that means everybody can plan simultaneously as long as you know the basic mission, and we did. And I'll let you look at that, and I won't belabor it. I want to talk to you a little bit about intelligence, and as we make the transition, I'm, I'm going to wait until John's eyes stop moving. John, nod when you're done reading that, please. John, are you ever going to nod? John's nodding, so we'll move on. Intelligence preparation in the battlefields we want to talk about now. Uh, I met someone here earlier that was in the Air Force, uh, in, in the U.S. Air Force equivalent of the Army Security Agency, did electronic intercept. We do several kinds of intelligence, signals intelligence, communications intelligence, and imagery intelligence, and there's a bunch of others. Human intelligence being probably the most effective. Signals intelligence, either the analysis of traffic, who's talking to whom, whether I can understand what they're saying or not, Signal intercepts, where I understand what they're saying, tells me something about it. Ultra magic, 
those things you heard about from World War II. But the thing that works best is a combination of human intelligence, I think, in this fight, and imagery intelligence. And I want to show you a product that the 1st Brigade, 1st Amateur Division did. That is the intelligence and fires overlay of the 1st Brigade, 1st Amateur Division. On each of those uh, little uh, positions that you see, the division, uh, the brigade rather, had identified a platoon position. And we would count number of platoon positions, three platoons equals one company, three companies equals one battalion, three battalions equals the brigade, and we drew the boundaries. Now I'm gonna show you the graphics of the brigade commander who commanded that unit. That's his graphics. When he was captured, his, uh, when he looked at what we saw, looked at what we had done, he said, oh my God, we are, we are lost. Your graphics are better than mine. That, my friends, is a powerful image. Those two images together is a powerful image of what your army could do against forces in the field, conventional forces, not the Taliban, not the, uh, the ISIS forces. That requires a different skill set. Conventional forces could do at the end of, uh, of the Cold War. On that basis, then, we knew where to attack them and how to do it. And the division commander narrowed the front so that he had an assault force of four, brigade, uh, four battalions in the 1st Brigade, three battalions in the 2nd Brigade, supported by 14 battalions and seven separate batteries of artillery firing a penetration. The penetration is narrow frontage, go deep, push out, and deny the enemy the capacity to interfere with your lanes into the penetration. Let me show you what that looks like. That are, those are the movements, generally speaking, the blue arrows, if you will, on the 24th of uh, February 1991 against the 26th Iraqi Division's 110th Brigade. Done, uh, preceded by a half hour preparation fire in which there were 10,000 uh, conventional rounds fired and uh, a bunch of rockets. I can't remember the total number. When I, when I saw that thing go in, it looked like a forest of brown trees shaped like pine trees had erupted from the ground instantaneously, and it stayed there for 30 minutes. And we thought, surely no one can be left alive. Wrong. They were stone left alive. Crazier still, they were willing to fight. And uh, I watched one guy. We had, uh, we had bombed, the, uh, bombed these guys. We had done this prep fire. We machine gunned their positions as we came in. We drove over their trenches, and uh, engineer bulldozers came behind and buried them. You know, so if you don't quit now, you're going you're gonna to get buried in your trench. And still these guys, were, a couple of them were fighting. And so John Bushy had a, a half, uh, half-blooded Cherokee, as he would say, Cherokee Indian, uh, fired a Miklik, which is a mine-clearing line charge. And it goes out, it's about 150 yards long, and it lays down its plastic explosive in, in clumps, like packages, a matrix of these things. And then when you set it off, the earth shakes. It is an incredible uh, kaboom, an unbelievable thing to see. And we put it over this platoon that wouldn't give up. And one guy came out of that, put out a net call. Under no circumstances does anybody shoot at this guy because he deserves to go home. Uh, anybody that could survive all that that guy did. And we made sure he got home. But as he walked out of the, out of the smoke and rubble, his clothes were in tatters, and he had the jitters. I, my heart went out to him. I said, I don't want to be that guy. This is what the breach lane looked uh, like from about two kilometers out. We wanted to make sure nobody get lost, so we dropped mine plows and plowed our way into the field where the fight would be from three kilometers so that nobody coming in would drive into where the minefields were. They could not miss the lane. Just in case they were too stupid to see that part of the lane, we put four by eight panels up. And all those were in, that's one of my lanes, Lane Charlie, from 3,000 meters out to the actual site within seven minutes of the preparation fire ending. And we were four kilometers away to do that. So we're talking about an army that moved with speed, with understanding of the commander's intent, because I couldn't talk to anybody on the radio. Because I'm a really smart guy and went to the School of Advanced Military Studies and later was the director of the School of Advanced Military Studies, John Bushy had an equally smart uh, Choctaw, or Cherokee Indian, I happen to be Choctaw, his tribe and my tribe being among the smarter of the Indians, got together and we said, you know, there's this promontory that overlooks our breach lanes, and we should go up there where we can observe the fight, and we'll bring a rifle company with us so that we'll be safe. 
We got there, and the Arabs, being of a different tribe, but nonetheless just as smart as we were, said, you know, there's a promontory up there. I bet the gringos were going to drive up there and try to watch the lanes. So we drove up there, and they shelled us with artillery, 12 rounds and about that fast. And, uh, you know, my opportunity to say something gallant like, you know, Greg expects everyone to do their duty or anything uh, passed because my radio wouldn't work. It died of fright and didn't work for about 15 minutes. The unit, however, understood what was required of them, and they did it without me. So my great moment in military history passed without me having so much as said anything. So uh, we expanded the penetration the next day, the 25th. When you expand the penetration the first day, we were going to push the enemy beyond direct fire range. Direct fire range in 1990 for T-72 tanks were three to four kilometers. So if you go back and you look at where we went the first day, uh, somewhere there's a picture. It's about four or five kilometers. They're outside of our direct fire range. The next day, we want to push them outside of their artillery range. And that means going out 25, 30 kilometers to make sure they can't reach us with artillery. That was the breach. Now, I'm going to describe one more fight to you. Then we're going to wrap this thing up and take some questions. Uh, the last fight I want to talk to you about is called Fright Night. If you've been, how many of you have been in the museum and seen the Bradley uh, presentation? That's the battle of, that's the Fright Night. Uh, John went in there and saw it for the first time today. Uh, you'd be interested to know John after he came out, other John. He said, ah, God, that was gut-wrenching. I could smell diesel fuel and smoke, which means it's a pretty good emulation of what things were like that night. It was as scared as I ever want to be again uh, during the night. It happened on the 26th of February is when it began. That picture on the right is, uh, I was so, I found that experience so compelling. I found an artist who happened to be a Marine, and he and I spent two weeks painting that painting. You know, he did the painting and I did the description. Uh, and since it was, I paid for the painting, it got to be my tank. And one of the things I want you to remember about your army is you see the bucket on the, hanging from the tank? A tanker never makes a mess in their tank. We always had a bucket, and if there was water, we would wipe our tank down with loving care. We also had a broom. You can see the broom. That's because one sweeps one's tank, because sand is not your tank's friend. And keeping things clean is trivial stuff, like washing your body and cleaning your equipment and making certain stuff is where it's supposed to be is a lot more important uh, than most Americans understand. And to this day, uh, having spent most of my life living outside and having people irrit irritated with me and occasionally shooting at me, my idea of camping now is the Hilton Hotel and my wife wants an RV, and we were in a constant struggle over that. Yeah, so far I'm winning the argument. I do not want to sleep anywhere near uh, something that moves. I've been, I've been there, done that. Uh, you can see that we got up, uh, we, we, we moved at sunup, uh, actually before sunup, on the 26th, moved all day. Got into a reserve position about 2.30. I made a really bad decision. I got my stuff off the tank. We're in reserve, right? What could go wrong? I'm going to get to sleep. And next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire, and we're on the move, and we didn't stop moving again until after the war was over. We did a night forward passage lines through a unit contact. So let me explain to you in Army terms, what, in real terms, what that means. Unit contact means the, other, the unit you're passing forward up, you're going to go through them, is shooting at the enemy, and the enemy is shooting at them. So you're going to say, excuse me, coming through, lady with a baby, but people are shooting in both directions. And you think, well, this sucks. Then once you pass through them, you have to hope they won't shoot at you. And then once you go through them, you have to hope nobody gets lost, turns around, goes the wrong way, winds up shooting at them. It's a sporty operation. And, oh, by the way, this was not the first information war. Everybody talks about, well, we have Desert Storm, first information war. We own the night. We have, you know, we have technology and digital humma humma. We didn't have any of that. We had GPS, but only three satellites. So how many satellites we have doing GPS now? Anybody know? About 150, 160? With three, guess how often GPS worked? The other thing they didn't bother to tell us is GPS had a, had a data error input it so that somebody that bought a GPS device couldn't use it to target. So we would say, why is this thing three or 400 meters off? Every time, I know this grid is here because it's an intersection. I can see where it is. I know exactly where I am. Yet the GPS says I'm 300 meters away. Well, it's because the United States government made it do that. Now the United States government doesn't care anymore, and you can take your GPS data is so good, you can use it to shoot dukes at the United States. 
So uh, not, all, not all technology is good and helpful. And the guys we were fighting was the, uh, the, the vaunted Republican Guard Forces Command. Now, I want you to remember now, and most of the people in this room are old enough to remember, that the pundits of the time said the U.S. Army wasn't very good and it couldn't fight very well. And the Iraqis, on the other hand, having fought against the Iranians, were a battle-tested, high-speed, low-drag army. Moreover, we were told time and again the T-72 was better than the M1 tank. The M1 tank was a gas-guzzling white elephant, too expensive, wouldn't work, was a complete failure. And the T-72, on the other hand, could kill it and shoot it at ranges excess of what we could. One of the reasons I went into the military intelligence business after I got out of the Army is the MI guys were telling us that. And I knew they were wrong. The MI is like any other institution. It falls in love with its enemy. It's the Stockholm Syndrome. You get to the point where, man, those Russians, if they're not 10 feet tall, they're six feet nine and a half at least. And the truth is, the Russian gear was about four feet nine and a half. And, and it was manned by the B team. And then the other thing is the MI guys, well, that was the export model. I've been in the import models in Russia and in the Czech Republic, and they're the same damn crappy pieces of gear. Our stuff was much better. The Bradley fighting vehicle. There's, a guy, there's an Air Force colonel made himself wealthy with a movie called Pentagon Wars, where he describes, anybody see the Pentagon Wars? The guy that played Frazier plays the Air Force colonel, Colonel Burton. Bradley fighting vehicles, a dog, going to kill our troops. Anybody here soldier in Vietnam in a 113 with a ga Mo gas uh, rubber bladder for a fuel cell? Anyone notice in Vietnam that a pistol round would go through a, a 113? Anybody with a rock could kill you? Bradley is an incredible improvement. But Burton been an airman. He didn't know that. He was flying in an air-conditioned cockpit. He had no idea what was going on the ground. But he got famous, and people made a lot of money making fun of the Bradley. Bradley is a death trap if it gets penetrated because it has two blunts, optically guided, optically, optically tracked, wire-guided missiles. And the propellant on those will burn like the fires of hell. And we haven't fixed that problem. We need to fix it. So what do the attack actually look like? That's the good guys, and I won't bore you with how many good guys there were, but it's a frontal attack. A frontal attack means, ali ali, income free, we're going straight up front. Forms of maneuver in those days were penetration, narrow attack against a, a specific point, frontal attack, not particularly sophisticated, and envelopment, go around the other side, or a turning movement, get over to their flank where they have to move in order not to get overrun. This is not a particularly glorious, not a particularly elegant thing, but it's, it's pretty good when it's dark and it's in the desert. And by the way, all the things the National Training Center did right, the one thing we never could do was live fire night tank attacks. Why would that be? because it's unsafe. Now, it was really puzzling to me that night that it was not unsafe for us to do it in combat, unsafe to do it in training with training ammo. Now we're going forward, real no kidding, it'll kill you as dead as hell ammo, and uh, it's okay. I was comforted by the battalion commander of the 134 Armor telling his guys, we were listening to each other's nets so we could coordinate, say, hey, it's gonna be okay because Greg and his guys have done night attacks. I thought it better not to tell Pat Ritter that no, we had never done a night attack because it was too dangerous. We attacked that night, and you see the results. It, is the, it was a violent, desperate fight. And we killed many more of them than they killed of us. But it wasn't free. We had six killed in action, 25 wounded, five tanks, and four Bradleys destroyed. The uh, Second Battalion, 66th Armor, and the 141 Infantry got into an internecine struggle, and there was some fratricide. And we're going to talk a little bit about friendly fire uh, with the two minutes or so I have left before I take some questions. So fratricide. So what does a fratricide look like? This is the results of a fratricide. It's an M1 tank. Uh, the, the officer who commanded that company was a guy named Bishop, really good guy. The vehicle in the top left is what's left of a Bradley when a Hellfire missile hits. Hellfire missile, by the way, John, is, uh, has a millimeter wavelength radar that allows it to find targets, and then it used laser guidance to get to the target, and it has a range of uh, just under 10 kilometers. So it'll kill you from a long way away. It weighs 100 pounds, packs a punch. And when one of those hits the Bradley, which is made of magnesium alloy and other things, you can see not much is left. And that's because the Bradley's equipped with tow missiles, and the missile propellant burns. We lost a couple of kids in that one. The tank on the other side, by the way, because it's compartmented, has blow-off panels, so if you penetrate the turret, 
and the ammunition goes, it goes up and out. In the Bradley, it stays inside with the infantry. That meant that we didn't lose anybody on that tank. Uh, we only lost one tanker that night in those five tanks. And he was killed because the Sabo round that got him, got the tank, went through him. We had another guy nearly died. He was burned badly because he decided to get back on the tank and get something he'd forgotten. And he got hit a second time. He's a wonderful human being. He was given a lot of blood so he could survive multiple surgeries. In one of those transfusions, he got hep hepatitis C. He has had a liver transplant. He's still alive, and he's still a happy man without a trace of bitterness. Now, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, I told him myself I'd have been a really bitter guy if I'd gone through what he did. But he isn't, and he doesn't suffer from PTSD. I don't know what kind of guy, how you find people like that, but, boy, he's, a, he's an impressive man. So let's talk just a second or two about why things happened the way they did, and then we'll take some questions. Empathy doesn't mean sympathy. All you have to have is some willingness to look at the problem from the other guy's side. One of the things I could do, and I want to make sure everybody knows this, this book could not have been written unless we had invaded Iraq. Terrible idea. I wish we hadn't done it. But when we invaded Iraq, we got the records. So I had the opportunity to read and understand what Saddam Hussein and some of his leadership were thinking uh, by spending a couple of weeks, thanks to the generosity of the McCormick Research Center, at the Conflict Records Research Center, which we have now closed because it's expensive to maintain it. Imagine that, the chance to learn why the other guy thought what he did, and we aren't going to spend a handful of dollars to, uh, to keep it up. That uh, CRRC record allowed me to read papers uh, that came out of the divisions, orders backwards and forwards, and the people that developed that information wrote several books. The man's name is Kevin Woods. Look him up on the internet. His books are available. They wrote a lot of things about why Saddam thought the way he did. Saddam was not an irrational man. Saddam was a Tikriti Arab from northern Iraq. And guess what? Despite what you may have heard, people aren't the same everywhere. The co Arab culture is not like ours. Rational behavior from an Arab point of view is different than our own. If you believe in, in that only if God wills it, you will make it to work on time, then your approach to life is different than our own. They have an honor-based culture. We have a guilt-based culture. Big difference. If you've ever seen uh, an Arab home, most of them are built with an enclosure that brings, that make, brings privacy to the home. What goes on inside is different than what goes on outside. Because if nobody saw it, it never happened. I taught my soldiers, discipline's what you do when no one's looking. In the Iraqi army, discipline's what you did when the general was there. It's not bad or good, it's just different. We don't think the way they do, and when you read the way they thought, they behave perfectly rationally. The other thing I, advantage I had was a, a, a lifelong Iraqi analyst for the uh, Israeli Defense Force named Pisach Malavani. He's just published a book that'll tell you more than you'd ever want to know about the Iraqi army. It's 1,300 pages long. But it is incredible. And he did a lot of translation for me. And, the, and I had two other great sources. The commander of the 2nd Republican Guards Forces Command was interviewed at great length, and I have his memoirs. And another man whose name I will not say to you because he asked to be left out of this, who was an Iraqi two-star living elsewhere so he doesn't get killed, became my best pen pal, and it helped me develop some sense of what they were doing. You see the rest of the things I put. I want to say a quick point about air power. The United States Army has not had to operate with hostile air uh, causing much of a problem since the end of World War II. That will no longer be the case if we have to confront one of our near-peer competitors. I used to say fondly that Dave Grange is dead. Dave Grange used to run this facility uh, was the last guy to be shot at by an airplane. I've, in fact, I've talked to Dave Grange Sr. not long ago. He's still alive, believe it or not. Uh, he got shot by a Focke Wolf 190 uh, toward the end of World War II. It hadn't happened to any of us since. And the reason is because we had air supremacy. Air supremacy means you can do whatever you want with impunity. Wasn't true in Vietnam, even. You couldn't do whatever you want with impunity because they would challenge you in North Vietnam. But in South Vietnam, we operated with impunity. We didn't have to worry about air attack. That's no longer the case. Uh, everybody with a couple of bucks can buy the S-300 or S-400, and that will dominate the airspace uh, in the early 21st century. Strategic lift, Civil Reserve Air Fleet, based on 747s. 
That's going. We have the Civil Reserve Air Fleet is something that needs to be funded by Congress. It isn't well funded. Uh, the Ready Reserve Fleet, the RRF, not well funded by Congress. Fast sea lift. You've got to have stuff to move stuff. I'm going to show you some including charts. I'm not going to talk about them. I'll let you read them. And I would submit to you the U.S. Army was actually quite good. And some myths. It really, at the end of World War, at the end of the Cold War, and at the end of the Storm, the, the New World Order is based on hubris and the notion that nobody would ever challenge us. We were the last hegemon. Uh, you know, we would go forward in peace and light in the sunny uplands of peace, to paraphrase Winston Churchill's uh, speech. It was a four-day war. Irritates me every time I hear it. That war started if you were in the 18th Airborne Corps or one of the F-15 pilots in August of 1990. If it looks like, smells like, feels like a combat zone, it is one. And it was from August 1990 on. Uh, it certainly was longer than four days for my brother who flew his first mission on the 18th of February, or 18th of January, downtown Baghdad with uh, telephone pole size uh, surfed air missiles passing his F-111. It was not the first information-based warfare war. John will tell you we operated with Xerox copies of 1 to 250 maps, which if you put your thumb down on it or finger down on it, covered up the entire position the battalion was in. And oh, by the way, it's hard to see uh, black and white at night. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite memories of Desert Storm is I thought I would find my way to this one fight because uh, there was a microwave tower on the map. I never found the microwave tower. Well, it's because they bombed the hell out of it the 17th of January and it had gone down, and I was too stupid to consider that it might have done that. We had low casualties. Well, not if you're one of them, but in those four days of that, uh, of that war, and I'll give you a, a quick uh, rundown on the casualties, we had uh, 1,500 coalition casualties, 467 Americans wounded, and uh, more than 300 U.S. KIA non-battle and battle casualties. In my own task force, we had two killed and four wounded. Uh, and that's the four wounded that were willing to report themselves. We actually had about eight or nine wounded. But, you know, you'd be surprised how many guys in their 20s who get a piece of shrapnel in the back of their head and decide they want to stay with the unit and have the doc pull it out with tweezers. Like, yeah, not me. I think I'd have been happy to go home. Uh, last slide. Does Desert Storm matter? Yes, because guess how many times we fight the guys we plan to fight? Right now, the Army's reorganizing itself into security force assistance brigades and relieving the, uh, the special forces <coughs> the re requirement to do that kind of work so they can focus on special forces and horses and Jedburg operations, which is commando stuff. I'm not sure that's a smart thing. I don't think we're thinking about this very well. Agility and flexibility come from training, my friends, not organizations. There's no organization on the planet that is flexible. The people in the organization make us flexible. And the Army's always talking about, we're going to organize flexible this is and that's. Uh, last thing, I continue to believe people matter more than things. This is, uh, this is Robert L. Dougherty's home. I haven't seen, I hadn't seen Robert Dougherty since the, uh, the afternoon of the 25th of February, 1991. I finally got to go see him a year ago this June. And uh, I think about Robert Dougherty, and the two others killed in my task force, they're on my desktop. I think about them every day. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that your Army fought as hard there as, as the 1st Infantry Division in the U.S. Army's ever fought anywhere. It wasn't Omaha Beach, but it wasn't a walk in the park either. Thank you very much. I took too much time, but there, is a, there will be a few minutes for questions. I was supposed to go 45, and I went 52 or 3 or something. I'm very sorry for taking so much time. Uh, questions, anybody? Nobody. Wow, this is very disappointing. Please run over and buy the book. Sir. Yes, sir. Could you uh, outline the events in Saudi prior to going across the border, the rehearsals for penetrating the first and second uh, lines through the border? Yes. And, and setting up those panels and everything, was that all pre-staged and ready to go? And how did you learn to do it? Uh, that's an excellent question because it gets back to that business of parallel planning. When we got alerted on the 8th of November, first of all, when he invaded in August, several of us, myself included, uh, 
Bert Maggart, my brigade commander, Tom Rame, after a few days, decided that we would be going. And Rame wasn't convinced, but he decided that a prudent human being would act as if we were going to go. So from the 5th of August on, we behaved as if we knew we were going to war. And what that meant was we be immediately went to school, changed track from looking at the Soviet Army, which was going away faster than we could, you know, we were thinking, what are we going to do next, to looking at the Iraqis. That's the first thing. Second thing was uh, we finally got alerted on the 8th of November. There had been some hints, rumor mongering from the Army staff, that we might be on the list to go. So if, if the thing grew. So on the 8th of November, Rame is down in, uh, Tom Rame, the division commander, is down in with the division headquarters in Fort Hood with three corps who was told they were going to go. And we were part of three corps uh, for training. So they came back the following day because when the announcement came out on 8th of November, it wasn't three corps, it was going to be seventh corps. On the 9th of November, Rame took a phone call from Fred Franks. I think it was the 9th. Buy that wonderful book and uh, you can get the date exactly. Uh, Rain was asked would he be willing to do the breach because we had been to the National Training Center with all of the brigades recently and we knew how to do penetration attacks against prepared enemy defenses. So from that day on, we knew we were going to do the penetration attack. So we did our first full up, uh, it's called a rock drill, figuring out how we do it in my motor pool with the whole division, the division's entire commanders, all, from company commander up in the motor pool bays of the 2nd Battalion, 34th Armor, and walk through how we would do a penetration at the division level. As, as division made decisions and the Corps made decisions, battalions made decisions, you're all marching in, in a parallel to each other against that threat so that as we got into the desert, you began to refine it. We knew what we wanted to do, which in my case, told my guys I wanted to go three platoons on one, everywhere I could, and I wanted to isolate the rest of the battle space, which is smoke, artillery, the rest of it. And division was doing something very similar. So by the time we actually published orders, they were historical artifacts because we'd always figured out how to do it, which is why my radio could work, and everybody knew where they had to go and what to do when they got there. So I, I don't know if that's a very quick answer to a really uh, important question, but, but the answer is we, took all, we had all the time there was, and we didn't know how long that would be, and we knew that we had no time to waste, so the, the focus was, uh, was really intense. Does that answer the question, sir? Good enough? Yeah, it's, a, you know, it's a close enough for government work, but uh, you know, if we get a chance to talk some more with you about it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Mason, from the 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, the Republican Guard has been uh, quoted or seen as some kind of elite unit, and you mentioned in your speech that looked like it was not so elite. How would you compare that to, let's say, the readiness of the Ameri average American soldier, and how would you compare, say, the uh, maybe the prisoners, the ones who are not in the Republican Guard uh, units, how would you compare them to the American soldier? Well, they're incomparable, literally, because they're so different culturally that the comparisons are inadequate, but, but the points of confluence are as follows. Many of them were legitimate patriots and believed in what they were doing on the Iraqi side. Many of them were devoted to, uh, the, you know, the unit we attacked had lots of Kurds in it. They weren't highly motivated soldiers for uh, Saddam Hussein. But they were highly motivated to survive the fight, and, you know, it's really hard to surrender in the middle of a gunfight. So they were, you know, they were willing to fight, you know, if, un, until an alternative could be presented to them. But in the main, the Iraqi Republican Guard Forces Command were well equipped, well fed, had had good gear. The uh, the the rest of the army, particularly the draftee divisions, which, if you look at the way they laid their defense out, they they started from the Persian Gulf and they worked their way west. We attacked them at the weakest part of their line. Well, you know, sound and prudent thing to do. The units that we attacked were about half strength. Uh, they were poorly equipped, inadequately trained, and poorly supervised. Some of that was because they were hey you'd right off the streets. We, we actually captured guys that were wearing street shoes. Uh, we actually captured a guy who uh, said, where the hell have you guys been? He claimed to be from Chicago. O only went home, only went home 
to be with his parents. And when he was home, you know, during this, this, this unpleasantness, when he was home, he got, hey, you would enter the army. I have no idea if that's the truth or not. I, I actually captured one guy twice. Because we didn't have anything we could do with these guys. Uh, we, we didn't have enough gear to take care of feed prisoners. So we would give them water and food, point them south, and say, have a nice day. You know, uh, don't leave home without this water, and took them off. So on the uh, second last day of the war, I captured this lieutenant. He had 14 guys, and he wanted to go to An Nazaria. He was Shia, and he wanted to take his Shia buddies with him. I said, look, dude, you got to walk across the entire 7th United States Corps. I won't shoot you, but I'm pretty sure somebody else will. You need to go this way. So the day after ceasefire, I caught this guy again. He didn't listen to me. And this time, I put his happy ass on a, on a truck with his arms bound behind him and sent him to the POW camp because I didn't want to go through the business of having to take a chance of getting shot by somebody who, who just wanted to go home. The long answer to a short question, they, they, they were the Republican Guard Forces Command fought like hell. I had one of my captains, Captain Juan Toro. We were repelling borders on the night, fright night. We had guys climbing on our tanks. And that's scary. Tankers don't like it when infantrymen, you know, the notion of an infantryman killing a real human being like a tanker just doesn't go. I mean, we're like the knights in shining armor, cavalier kind of guys. We don't appreciate it when just plain old infantrymen can kill us. I know you're an infantryman, Mason. That's why I'm working you over. And, and Juan shot one of these guys with all 15 rounds of his 9 millimeter pistol. Because once you get that scared, you're going to shoot till there's no chance this guy's even going to twitch again. That takes, those guys had courage. Some of them had no courage, but some of them did. And that's the problem we had. We didn't know who was going to fight and who wasn't. You would be taking a surrender from one group and another group shooting at you. That's very disconcerting when it happens. Long answer again. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Because the T-72 M1, for, for starters, uh, had an inferior night fighting capability. It couldn't see much past about 1,200 meters. Our system, the M1 system, the M1 tank, by the way, is a combination of hang the expense of what we got to cut cost. So we had, a, we had a, uh, a, a thermal imaging capability, not as good as the one we had on an older tank called the M6083. But they were trying to save a couple bucks, so we had the one we had wasn't as good. We could see to 1,500 meters and tell you what it was. We could see shoot and kill to 3,500 meters, but we wouldn't have any idea what we were shooting at, which is why periodically guys shot and killed other Americans. I would not let my guys shoot at ranges beyond 1,500 meters. And uh, there's a book written about my battalion in which they talked about wanting to kill one of the company commanders because they thought it was his order when it was actually mine because they were afraid somebody would shoot them and they wouldn't be able to shoot back. And, and I said, you know, I, I tried to explain to them, look, we can see to 1,500, sometimes better. They can't see past 1,200. We're not going to shoot. If we're not being shot at, we don't need to shoot. That's a real hard thing to sell to a 19-year-old kid who wants to go home. It's a pretty hard sale for me, and I was the one that came up with it. That's the first thing. The second thing was their ammunition was semi-fixed ammunition. That means they had a projectile and a separate propellant and the propellant was stored with the crew. Our, vi our tank ammunition was stored separately from us behind a firewall, and it had a blow-off panel. So if you penetrated it and it caught fire, the propellant would blow the rounds up and out through the blow-off panels. There's the T-72, every time you shot one, it was a catastrophic explosion. The turret would come up, rotate once, and come down beside the tank, usually right side up. A hell of a ride if you're the tank commander, but it's a one-way ride. So they had no crew protection, they had bad fire control, and the tank was not particularly reliable, and they would not stay in their tanks. Why not? Because Mother Air Force was dropping B-52 bombs on them. So they would hang out in bunkers, and when we'd show up, if they saw us, they would get into their tanks. Uh, you know, the, the B-52 craters were an inconvenience because one of my crews, one of my tanks drove into it when it took them a while to get out because it's 30, 40 feet across, 20 feet deep. B-52 craters, I mean, there's some bad, bad dudes, you know, that you don't want to get in a B-52 crater. Again, long answer to a short question, but their equipment wasn't very good. The T-55s and the Type 59s, the older tanks, were actually more survivable because they had cased ammo. So when you would penetrate, 
You might kill the crew, but the tank wouldn't blow up, so somebody might survive. We had one tanker killed with five tanks blown up. Think about that. That's because we had compartmented, uh, compartmented the crew from the equipment, from the ammo, and we had better armor than they had. We had reactive, uh, not reactive armor, ceramic armor they didn't have. It. There was a question over there. Yes, sir. read his book, and the thing, the single thing that he regretted most was allowing the uh, Iraqis after the war to fly helicopters, which they immediately turned on the uh, Kurds. Yes. Well, well, what's your take on that? Well, there were a number, look, uh, uh, boy, I, that's a different book, but the, the I, I tried to write the story of the end of war, and you want to talk about screwing up the end of a war, uh, the United States does that about as well as anybody does, but... Uh, if you think about, you know, Clemenceau's complaint about Mr. Wilson having 14 points where God himself only had 10, then you understand part of our problem with war termination. But George uh, Herbert Walker Bush had a limited mandate from the United Nations and a coalition of Arab states that were not going to tolerate anything beyond evicting the Iraqis from Kuwait. Once that job was done, his job was done. What nobody had thought about, and to include, I think, Mr. Bush and Secretary Baker, and certainly Norman Schwarzkopf, was how do we end this thing? And what are the conditions that we would want to, to have it? They, and, and I don't know everything I don't know about that, but we did not end that war in a thoughtful way. When he said, yeah, you can go ahead and fly helicopters, he had been given uh, nearly plenipotentiary powers to, to negotiate the, the initial ceasefire, not the formal ceasefire, the initial ceasefire. And he made a mistake. He made a horrible mistake. At the same time, George Herbert Walker Bush was, was uh, urging a Shia uprising. And the Shia duly said, yeah, we got it, man, we're on it. And we would get pitiable complaints and pleas from Basra and al Nazaria, come rescue us, they're killing us. And we had no mandate to do that. So you got to wonder why we would encourage them to, to rise up. Well, partly it's because we had no empathy for the other side. We didn't understand how they saw things. You know, the, the notion that getting rid of Saddam was going to solve all the problems in Iraq does not seem to have been a theory that would hold up when you look at how things have turned out. I think that was adroitly and diplomatically said. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be here tonight. Buy lots of books. Uh, you know, I need a new suit and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. So thanks very much. Normally at this time I would announce the next um, uh, date with history, uh, but it's not until March. Uh, we will not have one in December. Uh, this facility is going to close uh, sometime between now and the first week of December for renovations. We'll be closed most of uh, the winter of 2017, 2018. Uh, as you know, the First Division Museum also closes for the month of January. That's our annual uh, uh, maintenance month and we'll reopen in the first weekend in February. We'll be open for three-day weekends Friday through Sunday in February and then reopen in March uh, uh, for our regular hours. Uh, so we're going to take a little break uh, from all of this, but in this very facility this Saturday when the 5k run is here that will benefit the same Midwest shelter that I discussed earlier you can come and have a pancake breakfast with American Legion Post 556, Cantini Post 556, the American Legion, cooked by these two guys back here, uh, cheered on by myself and a, <laughs> and a crew of others, and that also supports the community service of the Legion uh, and the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Vets, so we want you to come to that. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have anything, Greg has done so much, he's been a subject matter expert, in the renovation of the museum. How many of you have been to the renovated museum? How many of you have not? Oh, well, let's see. You're going to have to go. Talk to the ones who said they have been. If you haven't been, please come. We, we, we think we did a good job. Uh, Greg was a subject matter expert uh, on that. Uh, he's done an incredible amount of work uh, for the First Division Museum over the years. I have thanked him profusely many times because I don't pay him a dime, uh, and almost everything I can think to give him, I've already given him. Uh, so, I don't know if this is pretty feeble. Um, I know he has this book, so really what I'm doing is peddling the book. Uh, 
This is Matt Davenport's book, First Over There, about the Battle of Cantini, for which this place is named. Uh, it's a fantastic book. If you're interested in American military history, you ought to read this book. But I know you don't have one like this because this one's signed by the author. And uh, so we'll give this to you as a token of appreciation for your presentation tonight, right? Thank you. Okay, now, while Greg is sitting there, those of you who have books can get in line to get them signed. The rest of you can go where? To the gift shop, down at the end of the hall. Buy yourself a book, come back here, get Greg to sign it. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you in March of 20, 2018.